the Senior Research Fellow at the African American Policy Forum. It's been my pleasure to produce this award-winning and Black Life series. And on behalf of APF and the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies, I'm honored to be sitting in the moderator seat today. We're delighted you to welcome to our newest episode in our virtual conversation series. Today is World AIDS Day, and this year's commemoration comes on the 40th anniversary of HIV's emergence in 1981. Since then, the HIV AIDS pandemic has claimed by most estimates the lives of more than 40 million people and gave birth to the first truly global public health response. Like the current COVID-19 pandemic, the AIDS pandemic also stoked a fierce political backlash to fundamental public health approaches. The forces of sexual moralism and media sensationalism soon overtook and distorted the debate over basic public health measures, such as needle distribution and condom access. Lawmakers seized on the mounting moral panic to produce a battery of harsh punitive laws in states throughout the United States to criminalize both the virus itself and the groups held to be most responsible for its spread, sex workers, drug users, sexually active gay and black Americans. This was replicated globally too. As of 2021, 35 states in the US have ratified laws that criminalize HIV exposure. Meanwhile, 92 countries have HIV specific criminal laws and or have prosecuted individuals in stigmatized social groups under general laws. As is the general pattern with criminalization fed by moral panics, these HIV crackdowns disproportionately harm black, brown, LGBT and sex worker communities. And on their own terms, punitive efforts for public health crises have been shown again and again to be policy failures, stigmatizing individual behavior and fueling secrecy, i.e. the very conditions that permitted the HIV AIDS pandemic to take broad hold in the first place. Advances in treatment have meant that a diagnosis for people living with HIV no longer automatically translates into a death sentence, and that the risks of transmission have been dramatically decreased too. But as a result of disparities in health access around the globe, HIV AIDS claimed an estimated 680,000 lives last year alone. Transmission rates likewise remain high, with 1.5 million people contracting HIV, the HIV virus last year as well. If we're able to finally overcome the HIV AIDS pandemic, it's clear that we must break the long-standing and destructive cycle of deploying criminal penalties that stigmatize those who are living with the virus. Only then we'll be able to finish the crucial work of creating robust incentives for people to know their status and get treatment. As we've seen throughout the past four decades, those are the basic requirements to manage both the effects of HIV and prevent its further spread. The theme of this year's World AIDS Day is global solidarity, shared responsibility. Those are the crucial watchwords in the effort to treat and contain the COVID pandemic too as well. And unfortunately, the halting and patchwork nature of that campaign makes it all too clear that we have yet to learn and process the lessons of the HIV AIDS crisis. As we contend with the challenge of these dual pandemics, we do well to heed the socio-medical cautions that are features of both crises, including a pronounced tendency to overemphasize individual actions over societal conditions, a pharmaceutical industry that elevates private profits over global knowledge and inoculation, and as of lately seen with the emergence of the new variant Omicron, a knee-jerk re reflex to depict a health crisis in the making as one which is a Black, poor African condition, an affliction which is in short racialized to become an aversion to the people in the global South over there, rather than a tragedy of our world comment. Today, we've gathered a stellar panel from across the globe to examine these issues and analyze the ways we need to start treating the HIV AIDS pandemic, not as a crime, but as, a public, as the public health issue it is. I'm glad to be joined today by Nathan Cisneros, who is the HIV criminalization analyst at the Williams Institute, where he studies the societal impact of HIV criminalization laws. He was previously in the political science program at UC Irvine, and before that worked as a case writer at Harvard Law School studying the legal profession. I'm pleased to be joined by Michaela Clayton, who's joining us from Namibia. And she's the former director of the AIDS and Rights Alliance for Southern Africa, a regional partnership of civil uh, society organizations working to promote a human rights based response to HIV AIDS and tuberculosis in Southern Africa. As a human rights lawyer, she has worked on HIV AIDS and human rights issues since 1989. She has also co chaired the UN AIDS Reference Group on HIV and human rights. Glad to be joined by State Senator Dallas Harris, who's a member of the Nevada State Senate representing District 11. Senator Harris previously worked as the administrative attorney for the Public Utilities Commission, and before that worked as a legal and policy fellow at Public, at Public Knowledge, a nonprofit focused on intellectual property law and the internet. 
Sibusi Sio Ndlela is an attorney in the health rights program at Section 27, a public interest law center in South Africa. Uh, prior to joining Section 27, she completed an LLB at the University of Cape Town, like myself, and she's an admitted attorney of the High Court of South Africa. Tony Newman is the author, is a, is a noted author, and is noted for her memoir, I Rise, The Transformation of Tony Newman, released in 2011. She's a trans and sex workers rights advocate and the interim CEO of the Black AIDS Institute, as well as the former interim executive director for Lyric in San Francisco. Diana Felice Oliva is the Associate Director of Public Affairs, Patient Advocacy and Community Engagement at Gilead Sciences. Diana has more than 15 years experience of, in working with the, in communities living with HIV and has worked in the field of social services and public health for almost 25 years. Eric Polk is a lawyer who serves as the Deputy Director at Georgia Equality and is a Soros Justice Fellow. At, at Georgia Equality, he oversees all day-to-day -day operations developing and managing local, state, and federal policy and advocacy activities that advance equity and fairness for LGBTQ communities and improves public and private responses to the HIV pandemic. As always, throughout this end of the Blacklight event, we want to hear from you. Please share your thoughts in the YouTube chat or tweet us at AA Policy Forum. You can expand the conversation across various social media by following AAPF on Twitter and Facebook and using the hashtag under the blacklight. You can send comments and questions to the YouTube chat and we'll be uplifting them throughout this conversation. So let's get started. Uh, Nathan, I'd like to come to you first. Um, this year's specific area of research and the, William in the Williams Institute has done tremendous work documenting how criminalization works across the United States. But let's maybe take a step back what do we mean when we, when we talk about HIV criminalization and how does this manifest in reality? Yeah, I'll, I'll start by saying we all have an HIV status and that status is either positive or negative uh, and we might know our status or not. So HIV criminalization refers to laws that criminalize, make illegal, uh, otherwise perfectly legal conduct uh, based solely on somebody's HIV status or else that create a penalty enhancement again, based solely on some of these HIV status. And I'll give you two examples. So in Ohio, if I engage in sexual activity with another consenting adult, and I don't disclose my HIV status, then that's perfectly legal, so long as that status is negative. If it's positive, then I'm liable for a class two felony. Another example, in Tennessee, prostitution is normally a misdemeanor offense, however, uh, if I know my HIV positive status and I'm a sex worker, I'm liable for a class C felony. And in Tennessee, uh, if I'm found guilty, then I also have to register on their sex offender registration, which since 2010 classifies this aggravated prostitution charge as a violent sex offense. So I would have to be on that registration for the rest of my life. So in both scenarios, uh, actual transmission isn't required to sustain a conviction, nor is intent to transmit, uh, nor is even the possibility of transmission. So we see in many of these laws, uh, thing, uh, conduct such as spitting or biting, which can never be a transmission route, uh, or uh, charges such as attempted solicitation or prostitution, um, uh, landing somebody in jail or prison. So we see uh, around the United States, over 30 states have uh, uh, such laws. Um, uh, most of these laws don't take into account the tremendous advances in treatment we've seen as well. So if you're in treatment today and you're virally suppressed, which means that uh, we can't detect HIV in your blood, then you're also unable to transmit HIV. So the public health slogan around this is U equals U, undetectable, equals untransmittable. So these HIV criminalization laws, uh, which uh, mainly came in uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and haven't been revised since, uh, over and over criminalize conduct um, that doesn't take into account the latest uh, science, uh, and also doesn't take into account the public health message that we're hearing from our public health experts today in the United States, including the CDC, which says that these HIV criminal laws can actually deter testing and treatment, which uh, is the best tools that we have to combat the epidemic here in the United States. Oh, thanks. Thanks for that summary, Nathan. Um, 
And, uh, and uh, you've, you've spoken about in your research, looking at the disproportionate impact this has on black people. And you've described this as the intersection between two pandemics. Could you elaborate what you mean by that? Yeah, so in, in the United States, uh, we are uh, dealing with two decades long epide epidemics now. One epidemic is the HIV epidemic, which is also a pandemic. The other epidemic is the epidemic of mass incarceration. Uh, and both epidemics in the United States, uh, Black Americans bear a disproportionate burden. So at the Williams Institute, we've studied state level enforcement of these HIV criminal laws. And we see in state after state that Black Americans are overrepresented in arrests, overrepresented in convictions, and overrepresented in sentences. And I'll give you a few numbers. So Black Americans are about 13 or 14% of the US population in 2019. Black Americans were 40% of the population of people living with HIV and about 33%, about a third uh, of all people in jails and prisons in the United States. And if we drill down uh, at the state level, so for example, in Nevada, about one in 10 Nevadans are uh, Black or African American about 40% of people who are arrested for HIV related offenses were black or African American. We look at Missouri, one in eight Missourians uh, identified as black, uh, about one in three arrests uh, for HIV related offenses uh, were for black, uh, black Missourians. We see the same thing with convictions as well. So in Georgia, for example, Georgia, one third of Georgians are black or African American, uh, nearly three fourths uh, of convictions uh, were for Black Jordan, uh, Georgians. And so wherever we go, we see the same pattern. Thanks, Nathan, for, for laying that out and the ways in which uh, the, in, the intersection of race and uh, criminalization impacts on Black people. Uh, Erica, I'd like to come to you just to pick up on that. Um, you do a, a amazing work uh, in your advocacy highlighting the intersection of this, uh, these two uh, epidemics. Um, can you explain uh, how this happens uh, with uh, reference to some, some, some work that you have done or, or cases that you're familiar with? Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Kevin. Um, so uh, the intersections of race, uh, policing of Black bodies, um, identity and HIV, I think are really uh, highlighted well in the Michael Johnson case. Um, this is a case out of Missouri back um, in 2013. Um, at the time, Michael Johnson was a 23-year-old Black gay college wrestler. Um, he was sentenced to 30 and a half years in prison under Missouri's HIV criminal law for transmitting HIV to one sexual partner and exposing um, um, HIV to four other people, um, all of whom were white. Um, after deliberating for two hours, uh, the nearly all white jury, um, there was one black juror, uh, found Michael guilty. Um, leading up to the trial and throughout the trial even, uh, racial caricatures were used to describe uh, Michael online, uh, which really demonized his sexuality um, in online commentaries and, and in, even in an informal uh, online post about the case. Um, as such, um, I don't think that uh, we go far enough when we just consider um, how like the black codes regulated black bodies or how sodomy laws uh, regulated intimacy between um, uh, gay men or even how HIV criminal laws impact uh, communities of people living with HIV. We have to look at all of the pieces and consider them um, consider all the parts uh, together. Johnson essentially, you know, walked into that courtroom with three strikes against him, uh, being black, uh, gay, and a person living with HIV. And so we know that arrests and prosecutions um, by default impact communities already over-policed by the criminal legal system um, and profile for race, uh, physical and mental health status, gender identity, sexuality, um, and involvement in street-based economies. Um, thus, the most impacted folks uh, uh, by HIV are also those who are most um, affected uh, by, the, by the country's system of mass incarceration, much to, to Nathan's point. 
um, as well as this unaddressed and unresolved issues around racism, um, uh, anti-LGBTQ sentiments, um, and transphobic discrimination and violence. Thanks for that, uh, Eric. And every time you just, I remember reading about this case um, a few years ago when the initial reporting was came out and it's just kind of, it's really shocking to imagine the ways in which uh, these centuries old uh, pathologies around black people and the sexualization of black people and black men as well, um, just was so evident and so plain to see in this case. Uh, what role do these myths and stereotypes uh, uh, contribute to the ways in which black people uh, living with HIV interact with the criminal law? Yeah, I mean, these laws, uh, you know, that these myths really uh, absolutely contribute um, uh, to the impact of these laws on Black communities. Um, uh, these laws feed into stereotypes that assume that Black gay men are irresponsible and hypersexual um, and pathologize the ways in which uh, Black sex is described as inherently more risky or inherently more dangerous uh, than when white people engage in the same uh, sexual acts. Um, in almost every news account from the, the Michael Johnson um, case, uh, there were photos of him, um, his dark skin, his muscular body, uh, often, often uh, shirtless torso. Um, and, you know, this narrative just around sort of the hypersexualization of, of Black men. Um, so this fascination with, with Michael Johnson's body also carried over into the trial. Um, you know, there was a constant uh, repetition of the name Tiger Bandigo. Um, that was a name that uh, Michael used uh, for social media accounts, um, you know, uh, which, you know, um, invokes a certain connotation. Um, during the trial, um, the prosecutor uh, talked a lot about and described Michael's penis in graphic detail. Jurors were even shown images uh, from a sex tape that Michael had made uh, with one of his partners. Um, and sex with Michael was described as rough and forceful. Um, and so this really fits into that mythology that frames Black men as hypersexual uh, deviants who are, you know, um, likely to rape white women or uh, as hypersexual in a way that commands sort of sexual prowess um, that also elicits sort of curiosity and desire. Um, so his accusers kind of viewed him as sort of the ultimate sort of uh, sexual conquest until they had to really interact with all parts of him. And so we see this play out um, time and time again. And so by, you know, really situating uh, Michael's black body as a potential threat, um, folks can use the myth of sort of hypersexual black males um, to differentiate themselves um, from black men, and then to even uh, go so far as to attack them. Um, I think that it's also just worth noting that this also kind of shows up um, with conversations um, uh, with cisgender women, especially um, Black cisgender women, uh, where there is this whole discourse um, about how these laws protect them from um, Black uh, men on the down low. And so again, there is the same sort of narrative um, about um, these hypersexual um, Black men who are, you know, going out and uh, bringing HIV home to unsuspecting uh, wives and girlfriends. And so it just, again, uh, reinforces a stereotype um, strips agency away from, from women and uh, further demonizes Black bisexual men and Black men who have sex uh, with people of different genders and really creates this sort of sexual panic uh, that's based on biphobia, uh, racism, and heteropatriarchy. Thank you. 
Wow, thank you. Because there's so much to unpack there. I think, I mean, we, lots of us can recall the sort of paranoia Oprah created when she had that infamous down low episode. And I also think just, it's just, just thinking about what you're talking about, just the way the fetishism of uh, Black people uh, operates to, 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 real, to, to leave disproportionate impacts uh, in something like HIV criminalization. So it's amazing insights there. Thank you very much. Um, Tony, I, would, I wanted to turn to you now. Um, we know that HIV criminalization uh, not only just pushing impacts Black people as a, as a monolith, a monolith, excuse me, but it's further exacerbated by uh, the, by the people who live at the intersection of various marginalized social groups, such as members of the trans community and the, the sex worker community. Um, how do you see this happen in your work and in your advocacy? Well, as a as a trans woman of color myself, uh, transitioning twenty years ago. Um, as a sex worker in the state of New York City, I found that um, you know most of the trans uh, individuals were doing survivor sex work. We find that over 60% of trans women of color now are doing survivor sex work, and over 63% of trans women of color are now HIV positive. So what we are finding is that trans sex workers are disproportionately affected by HIV. In the United States, trans sex workers are nearly six times as likely to be living with HIV than the general trans population that's encountered to my white trans brothers and sisters, and 25 times as likely to be positive than the general population. So I, I, I'm finding that the transgender community is, is facing hardship as a sex worker, which is a misdemeanor. If they are then tested positive for HIV, when arrested, that is upgraded to a felony, which then gets into all types of things such as you can't get a job, you can't get housing, you can't be financially secure. We're also finding that in, in California, sex workers make up 95% of the individuals charged with HIV related crimes in California. And that is being led by black women in California. So what we're finding in, when we deal with the HIV criminalization on, on a survey done by CIRA on the Transgender Law Center, we're finding that when transgender uh, respondents responded, 58% of the transgender respondents feel as it is reasonable to avoid getting tested. So they're not getting tested for HIV, so therefore they're not getting any type of health-related services. And 48% felt that it was unreasonable, was not reasonable, it was reasonable to avoid treatment. So what we're really finding is that this is a, a, a double whammy for sex workers and trans sex workers, because you have sex work, which is a misdemeanor, which is then complicated when you're arrested with a drug to a felony or you tested positive for HIV. That's also a felony. So what we're finding is that trans women are getting double discrimination, not only as African-Americans and Latins and Asians and people of color, but they're also getting discriminated against just for being transgender um, and a sex worker. Um, and, and that's a real problem even in 2021 today. I find that we are on that low totem pole that needs the most attention in order to move forward. Uh, and while I was at St. James, we were working on a decriminalizing prostitution under State Senator Scott Weiner. We have SB 357, which was started when I was there. Uh, it's now passed the Senate in California, and we're hoping that can go to the assembly and pass. These are the types of things we need to help our trans brothers and sisters here today with the HIV and the sex worker, because they're doing sex work, not out, of, out of, of a joy. Most people get confused. I wasn't doing sex work 22 years ago uh, with a master's degree from Wake Forest in Chapel Hill because I enjoyed it. I did it because I couldn't get a job after 125 applications of rejection. I found myself on the street with, with trans women who had no education, no GED, but we were family. So I was one of the very few to make it out. And only one of my friends of 30 from 1999 is still living today, Ms. Caprice Carthen. So I always shout her out as a trans woman of color working in the HIV field. Oh, uh, um, thank you so much for that, that, that insight, Tony. And it's just 
yeah, just really hot, shocking to hear that and the, the real crisis, this unspoken crisis that is clearly going on. Um, and uh, there's very little, it's a very political will um, to sort that. So we're very grateful for the work that you are doing. Um, we know that from our own work in the Say Her Name campaign, um, that when we look at uh, violence, to black women, state violence against black women. And we, we raise the names of women like uh, Kayla Moore, um, Maya Hall, Duana Johnson, Nisa Morris, and other black trans women who uh, were killed at the hands of the police. Um, that apart from all of these laws that create these uh, uh, as punitive web of, of criminalization on HIV, HIV AIDS status, um, uh, around sex work, and just the gender policing that uh, that trans women have to experience. Um, what are some of the uh, lived impacts that those have um, on uh, Black trans women, especially those uh, engaged in sex work, and how does that leave them liable to exploitation and uh, and abuse? Well, you know, if you're a sex worker. Um, and a date comes to you and says, I offer you more to do sex without a condom. You are in need of money. So therefore you are vulnerable to, in order to take that offer to say, how about I give you an extra hundred bucks for a sexual encounter? You are then putting yourself at risk um, for HIV, gonorrhea, and syphilis, but we're also finding at least 35% of the clients of trans women of color are violent against them. Um, we're finding that over 35% of the men who come to trans women for sex work, um, not only come for sex work, but come with a some type of a violent attitude of, of a depreciation of services as if they are not valued and don't want to pay and there's an engagement of violence um, and so forth and so on. And then we find these young ladies are killed and less than 15% of these individuals are found and prosecuted. So how many women of, of transgender must die before the public says that murder is a crime? You are so quick to arrest trans women for prostitution, drug use, HIV status, updating them to a felony, but we are unable to find out the killers and assault people of the trans women who have beat them, robbed them, and killed them. Less than 15% of these individuals uh, are found guilty, less than 15% are even brought to justice. So we should be cognitive that trans women, regardless of what you think of their gender and what they've done to their body, are human people who deserve equality and human rights. I think we have to click in our minds, regardless of our religious statue, I come from a Christianity background, which I had to abandon and get in a more spiritual light. We have to then decide if this is a crime, why are these individuals who are killing these trans women not being prosecuted? You hear that they die and we say their name on Trans Day of Remembrance, but no prosecutions are happening. People are not found, they're not held liable. And I'm asking our community and the world, why is that? That trans women are being killed and after a day or so of saying their name, no one really stands up for justice for them. Um, and I think that's one of the major problems that people think they can harm a trans woman of color and actually get away with it without any, any crime being charged, any repudiation. So I, I think that's the biggest thing that I, I think are facing sex workers and trans women uh, 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 of color is why are these men not being prosecuted? Why are we not saying their names in court and getting justice? Thank you so much for that, Tony. And I think you just really just depicted the ways in which, uh, because we often speak about the, 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 the way, the, just the massive issue, um, the epidemic of uh, the, the killing of uh, black trans women um, and the ways in which HIV criminalization acts as a complete uh, a tool to allow that to happen and in any society in any society that saw the rates of death and abuse and exploitation would be shocked and I think thank you very much for bringing that and sharing that with our audience today. Um, uh, Michaela, um, I'd like to come, come to you now just to widen our lens a little bit. Uh, we've looked at the we've looked at the US um, for now, but we know that this is definitely not an American problem and even more so this is a global problem and a problem particularly um, in Southern Africa. So I would like you to widen our lens to the global scale of this issue. Uh, you have been at the forefront of advocacy for the rights of people living with HIV, 
and the treatment of the condition in Southern Africa for 35 years. Can you paint us a, a, a brief sketch of as to how you developed uh, or how you saw the, de the, the development of the opposition to these laws in the region and how was that uh, rationalized and some of the debates that went about in, in, in coming to opposition to these laws? Thank you. Um, I think we need to go a little bit back in history. I mean, we, we've heard from previous panelists about, you know, when these laws started coming to play in the States, which was um, already in the 90s. Um, it was only from the early 2000s here that um, that we saw in, in initially in West Africa and then subsequently moving across the, the continent, um, these HIV specific criminalization provisions. Um, and unfortunately they were attributable to um, a model law on HIV that was developed um, in West Africa with support from USAID in 2004, which was, I think, had good intentions in the sense that it was supposed to provide a, um, it was supposed to provide sort of a model law for responding to HIV, including, um, you know, no testing without consent, non-discrimination provisions, but unfortunately it also had a clause in it that specifically criminalized HIV transmission um, exposure and non-disclosure. And we then saw a sort of epidemic of laws moving across the region. So it was only, you know, and, and this this was very troubling to us working on, you know, in, in the, on human rights in the context of HIV. It didn't seem to make any sense. Um, and certainly to our mind constituted serious human rights violations. Um, so in two, and what was interesting um, at that time was that the calls for um, for these criminalization provisions and the support for these criminalization provisions was coming largely from women's groups um, in, in civil society. And that was understandable um, in the sense that you know, in most of our countries in, in Southern and East Africa are, are very patriarchal and women don't have an awful lot of control over their own bodies. Um, and so, you know, women were frustrated and were scared of the fact that they were being exposed to HIV within their relationships and they were not able to do anything about it. And so they saw, women saw then the, um, you know, the implementation of these criminalization laws as a source of protection for them. Um, and so in 2007, um, we, a number of us, Arasa and a number of other partners convened a meeting in, in South Africa where we got together about 40, representatives from different women's groups looking at you know look, looking at the whole issue of, of, of HIV criminalization and it was one of those few meetings in my life where <laughs> you'd see these light bulb moments happening where as you start unpacking the whole issue of criminalization um, you see mm -hmm. suddenly it's like well actually this is not great for women at all once you actually understand how this is going to work because very often, well, most often women are the first to know their HIV status within their relationships because they go for antenatal care. Um, because of the serious power imbalance within relationships, women are not able to disclose their status when they find out that they're living with HIV to their partner. They can't enforce safer sex. Um, um, there's a real fear of violence if they disclose or they try and enforce safer sex at the hands of their partner. Um, or being thrown out of the home. And in many instances, women and, and their children are economically dependent. So that's not an option on the partner. And so as we started unpacking this, it was like, actually, no, this is, <laughs> this is not gonna work because at the end of the day, it's women who are gonna get prosecuted first. And we've seen that play out. Um, you know, we've seen that play out in the way that prosecutions have happened in the region. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for rec recounting that history, uh, Michaela. And it's just, it kind of, it, it really does depict for you the ways in which the law uh, is structured in patriarchal and racist ways that these laws, which are apparently neutral on their surface, ended up having a disproportionate impact on women and, and uh, in the region, it would be black women in this case. Um, and, you know, some of these, these insights are, you know, some of the insights that gave birth to um, intersectionality and critical race theory, this cleavage between two groups, uh, understanding uh, the ways in which the laws could intersect in these particular ways. We know that from recent figures in Southern Africa that young women account for one in four new infections and are twice as likely to be living with HIV as men. Um, what did it take uh, for folks in the region to realize that, that these laws have, would have a disproportionate impact uh, on women's lives? You know, I think we, we, we've seen, you know, as I mentioned, I think 
the um, if you look at the, the prosecutions in the region, uh, Zimbabwe is the country where um, there have been the most prosecutions. Um, so, you know, uh, of the 11 prosecutions that have been recorded in, in, in Zimbabwe over the last 15 years or so, um, maybe slightly less, um, 10 of those were against women, um, only one against a man. Um, and so women are women are being prosecuted um, for for not even for transmission for exposure, um, and it makes it it just makes absolute no sense at all. Um, and and the problem is that you know in terms of if you talk about intersectionality, women are not just women are not just women. Women can also be sex workers. Women living with HIV could be sex workers. Women living with HIV could be women who use drugs. Um, and so women living with HIV are then facing multiple layers of, 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 um, of, of, of criminalization, um, which in turn exacerbates stigma and discrimination against them, which they, they already face, but now on, on multiple levels. Um, and so HIV criminalization in itself is really, um, you know, not only has an impact in and of itself on, um, um, on women, but it, it also acts to, to exacerbate the impact of other forms of criminalization against women living with HIV. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think uh, just, just picking up on just what you said and what uh, Tony said, um, it just really acts as a place that increases the, ex the potential expectation of women. You know, we just showed uh, the ways in which uh, a, a male, uh, male partners can use HIV criminalization laws as part of revenge uh, plots, mm -hmm. um, as reprisals towards women. So it really shows uh, what happens when uh, women are disempowered in society, that the law is obviously going to disproportionately impact them. So thank you so much for showing how that happens across the region. Um, Sibu Sisiwe, I want to come to you as my, as my fellow South African based here. Um, South Africa has uh, more people living with HIV um, than any other country in the world. Um, we know that advocacy in South Africa uh, did a lot of work to prevent specific HIV criminalization statutes, but that did not stop. Uh, that does not mean that there have not been prosecutions of HIV under more general criminal laws. I know that you're personally uh, involved in, in work um, uh, related to these cases. So I wonder if you could just describe some of the work uh, that brings you to HIV criminalization. Thank you, Kevin. So as you've rightly pointed out, South Africa doesn't have HIV specific laws. Instead, we criminalize um, HIV transmission and exposure through general provisions of the law, which is the common law. And the way in which um, HIV exposure and transmission has been criminalized is primarily through the offense of attempted murder. And in the past, there have been two important cases that have criminalized um, HIV exposure specifically. Um, the first of these cases is the case of State versus Nyalunga. Briefly, the facts are that the accused raped the complainant and um, the accused was HIV positive, or at least he was the person living with HIV and he was aware of this. Um, subsequent to, to this, he was charged with attempted murder and rape. Um, an interesting fact about this case is that the complainant didn't have to test for HIV. So we never really knew what her status was, but nonetheless, the accused was convicted of attempted murder and he was also convicted of rape. The attempted murder charges or the conviction is the one that applies specifically in the context of HIV exposure. And one of the key things about this case is that they found that the accused had the sufficient intention to transmit the virus because oh, wow. he was he foresaw the possibility of transferring HIV, but he reconciled himself to, to that consequence. And he didn't take any precautionary measures to prevent transmission of the virus to the complainant. That, of course, is the first case. The second case is the case of state versus Piri. Briefly, the facts are that the accused was working as a counselor at a voluntary counseling and testing center. That's where he met the complainant. The accused was HIV positive. The complainant came to the voluntary counseling and testing site and she tested negative at the time. Um, subsequent to this, the accused and the complainant had unprotected sex and the complainant subsequently tested positive. The accused was then charged with attempted murder 
and he was convicted. And this was on the strength of the precedent of the earlier case of State versus Nyalunga. So that basically demonstrates that we do have established precedent that centers on the use of attempted murder to convict persons who expose and transmit HIV to complainants. But what we're seeing more recently is there's a pending case right now that's before the magistrate's court in Pretoria. And it presents a novelty in the sense that there is an attempt to now criminalize non-disclosure of HIV. What they're doing in this case, or at least what the prosecution is doing, is they are using the offense of rape under false pretenses to criminalize non-disclosure of HIV. And if we just think about the facts of this case, the facts of this case basically are that the accused transmitted HIV to the complainant when they had sexual intercourse, and this was unprotected sex. Um, subsequent to this, the, the complainant tested positive. Now the accused is being charged with attempted murder, which is in accordance with the established precedent that I've set out, but he's also being charged with rape under false pretenses. And the basis for the charge of rape is that in the absence of disclosure of a positive HIV status, consent is then eroded such that it can no longer be said that consent was obtained and instead it was obtained by fraud. So that's actually a pending case right now that is basically threatening to expand the criminalization of HIV, HIV disclosure specifically, which is a departure from the established precedent where we just criminalize HIV um, exposure and non or exposure and transmission. Thank you so much for, for laying, really just laying that, uh, that the case law in South Africa out. And I think for you know, people like uh, tuning in and listening, you know, all of those cases are particularly uh, awful uh, examples of gender-based violence, of rape and sexual assault. And a lot of people may be imagining why, you know, why it's a bad thing that we do criminalize the potential exposure. Um, why even in this example, it's going as far to potentially say that um, the non-disclosure of your HIV status, if you if you're positive amounts to a, a consent not being present. Why do you think this actually will have the opposite effect um, and have a, have a, a, a negative effect for attempts of, for us to um, uh, treat and manage the HIV uh, pandemic in South Africa and uh, the stigmatization that uh, arises from it? So the organization I work for, Section 27, is basically following the developments on this pending case because there are a number of issues that we think are brought up by this, um, this case. The first of them is the public health consequences of criminalization, specifically on how they undermine the response to HIV. The first factor under this point is that when we criminalize HIV transmission, exposure, or non-disclosure, what you're essentially doing is you're discouraging health-seeking behavior. What this means is that it's unlikely that people will attend healthcare facilities to be tested for HIV because they know that in the event that they test positive and in the event that they have unprotected sex, then they can easily be subjected to criminal liability. And in the case of those who don't know their status, then they can't access HIV treatment. So then they remain um, un they basically remain persons who don't know their status and they can't receive treatment. Then in the case of persons who do know their status and they know that they're persons who are living with HIV, they might not want to um, receive HIV treatment, ART, because that would basically constitute evidence of their HIV status. And that is something that they wouldn't want third parties to be aware of. For instance, you wouldn't want a third party to know that you're on ARVs because you know that that's something that could likely lead to criminal liability. Also, in the case of persons, it also discourages people from, from seeking assistance and in healthcare systems. So you might find that a person might be more willing to self-test for HIV using one of those rapid home test um, kits at home because they just don't feel as though they are willing to go to a healthcare facility that will record their medical evidence and evidence which can obviously be used against them in a court of law. So that's one of the points. The second point is how criminalization basically 
encourages the stigma around HIV. And if you just simply look at even the, the way that um, HIV is criminalized in our country, we use the offense of attempted murder. And this is occurring in spite of the fact that scientific evidence demonstrates that HIV contraction or being HIV or being a person who lives with HIV doesn't really amount to a death sentence. So that alone is, is sufficient to carry through the HIV stigma. And another thing that makes us want to follow this case is because there have been significant scientific advancements that demonstrate that antiretroviral treatment is capable of extending a person's life expectancy. And it's also capable of lowering, lowering a person's viral load um, to undetectable levels such that it's difficult for them to transmit the virus to, a virus to other people. So when we use the criminal system to try to achieve public health outcomes, we can see that there are some shortcomings that are, that are being um, displayed and it's not, a co it's not conducive to responding effectively to HIV. And another factor that I think is quite important that has been emphasized by the other, other panelists is that criminalization has a disproportionate effect on vulnerable categories of persons. And these vulnerable categories of persons are already persons who qualify as key population individuals that are vulnerable to being infected with or being affected by HIV in the first place. And one of the last reasons why we want to intervene in this matter specifically is because there isn't really any evidence that criminalization has a deterrent effect on, on this harm causing behavior. So there isn't a justifiable reason why criminalization or even over criminalization should be pursued. Thanks, folks. Thanks so much uh, uh, for laying that out, uh, Um, I just, the ways in which it's very counterintuitive that the science on criminalization is about 30 years uh, behind, especially in a world of U, U equals U, as, as Nathan described, and also that while there, is a, there may be a, an instinct, an instinctive urge to um, a, both a retributive and, a, and a, a deterrence urge to add HIV criminalization, particularly in, in context even of gender-based violence, that it actually it does more harm than good. Um, so thank you for laying that out from a South African perspective. Diana, I'd like to come to you now. Um, we've heard a lot about the ways in which these wars come to impact people who live at the various in, at the intersection of various social categories. In many respects, your journey as a trans first generation Latinx immigrant living with HIV and now um, in a in a in a the position that you're in now is emblematic of that. Do you mind sharing your story uh, with our viewers today um, uh, to kind of highlight that? Yes, definitely. Um, and just, I just want to say thank you to the African American Policy Institute, the Williams Institute for this in invitation to speak on World's AIDS Day. Um, and to really just share space, it's an honor and a pleasure to meet all the panelists here today and, and to just be witness to the amazing work that everybody is doing on the ground in changing these policies and laws, not only in the US, but globally. Um, as a person who has been living with HIV for almost 22 years, as a self-identified transgender, Latina, um, Mexican-American, first generation, a daughter of an immigrant, um, you know, when I received my diagnosis almost 22 years ago, for me, it was a death sentence. Um, we didn't have the scientific advancements that we do now. And unfortunately, you know, there was a lot of fear and stigma and shame attached to my diagnosis 22 years ago. Um, and I engaged in survival sex work in order to put food on the table and to put a roof over my head and to put clothes on my back. Um, and you know, 22 years later, I get to work with Gilead Sciences as the Associate Director of Public Affairs and Community Engagement and Advocacy, and get to be the programmatic lead of our philanthropic efforts in funding many initiatives across the US with our National Alliance partners and our community-based organizations trying to repeal and modify these laws that were actually developed based off of fear and shame and stigma. 30 years ago, and I'm proud to work for a company that um, we at Gilead know that it takes more than medicine to end HIV, and it really takes a multiple industry approach with not only um, pharmaceutical industry leaders, um, government entities, and uh, nonprofit organizations across the country to understand the social determinants that affect HIV. And one of those is, of course, the criminalization of HIV. And so, in my personal story, 20 years ago in 2001, 
I was arrested as a survival sex worker on the streets of Los Angeles and um, was incarcerated and was sentenced to 60 days, unfortunately. Um, and it was in my incarceration uh, period that I really came to the realization that um, I wanted to live in my authentic truth, and that was being a transgender woman. And so when I was released from the LA County Jail, um, I went back to school and got my master's degree in social work from Columbia University and dedicated my life ever since to the eradication of HIV and to the marginalized communities that HIV unfortunately disproportionately impacts. And so I get to work now at Gilead, um, providing philanthropic funding initiatives for many organizations like the Wilkins Institute, the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, uh, the Ciro Project, the US HIV Caucus, the Counter Narrative, the Transgender Law Center, Positive Women's Network, and the Center for HIV Law and Policy um, to do all amazing work because I think it really needs to be a, full, a multifaceted approach in order for us to end HIV criminalization laws in this country and around the world. Thanks so much for that, Dan, and just for the amazing work that, uh, that you do now and that you are behind. I just wanted to pick up on some, uh, just uh, some of the aspects of your own personal story. I know from reading your personal story that it was not only, not only were you interacting with the criminal justice system, but it was largely because of your own uh, advocacy and advocating for yourself, considering the fact that, you know, uh, criminal defense here in, in, in the United States uh, is, is not the best route for being able to avoid some of the worst outcomes of the criminal, uh, with the criminal justice system. Can you explain how you were able to advocate for yourself? And in fact, if it wasn't for you advocating for yourself, you probably wouldn't be in your, the position you are now. No, I think my life, you know, that's a good point, um, Kevin, my life would probably be um, totally different if I would have ended up in the state, um, federal, I mean, the state correction system um, and, and served years rather than months. And so uh, I quickly learned in my diagnosis um, as much as I could about HIV and the transmission and the science behind it. And I knew that once I was on medications, which I was when I moved to Los Angeles, um, that um, and even before the the term became popular, the e the u, u the u equals u was that I knew that my risk of transmission was very low, and so unfortunately, the prosecuting attorney, nor my public offender, nor the judicial system in Los Angeles. We're, we're aware of the scientific advancements of our HIV medicines. And so it took a lot during the court proceedings in order for me to advocate on my own um, and educate in the public defender and the prosecuting attorney um, to overturn the felony charge to a misdemeanor charge and just charge me with solicitation rather than um, you know, the intense and the enhancement charges. And so, um, but you know, I happen to be you know, born in this country have a certain amount of power and privilege because I speak both languages. I had somewhat of an education at that time, and I was just determined and passionate in order to make sure that I saved myself from the state system and 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 accept the county system uh, consequences of my actions. And so it just took a lot of self learning and self advocacy in order to make sure that um, I'm able to be here today and and speak on this panel of World Aids Day. Thank you, and we're very glad to have you. And just thank you from thank you so much for just allowing us into that story. And as you said, that um, you know, it's you are under incredibly uh, difficult conditions, able to advocate for yourself. But many people who have an interaction and are living with HIV, um, interaction with the criminal justice system, uh, may not are likely not to end up um, in uh, to have had the outcome that you had. So I think that's testament to the fact of why we need to have a really broad based and a systemic look at removing these laws. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I'd like to turn to uh, State Senator Harris now. Um, uh, Senator, I know you are a legislator on the panel. I'm interested in what brought you to this work and advocating to decriminalize HIV in, in your home state of Nevada. Well, thank you um, first so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you, uh, especially given all of the great work you all have done. Um, you know, as a, as a legislator, uh, you deal with every issue under the sun. And so um, it's kind of difficult to decide what issues you're going to tackle in, in any given uh, legislative session. Uh, this issue, however, was um, very easy for me to decide to uh, take on. Uh, a mentor of mine, Senator David Parks here in Nevada, the first openly gay 
uh, legislator, served with me and had been working on this issue uh, for decades, literally decades. Um, he retired uh, recently after being termed out, and I was fortunate enough to be able to kind of pick up this mantle and help get HIV modernization over the finish line in our state. Uh, and, and as has been mentioned, this issue directly affects every part of my identity. I am a uh, African-American, openly gay uh, woman. And we've discussed a lot about how HIV criminalization uh, disproportionately affects each and every one of those, those categories. And so uh, just by nature of who I am and, and the, the uh, intersectionality of this issue, uh, it really touched very close, uh, close to home for me. Um, you know, I'll also say, I think there are um, a plethora of issues where we see disparities uh, in enforcement, uh, especially when it comes to African Americans, and, and I've tried to dedicate myself to addressing those issues and closing that disparity um, anywhere I, I find it. Thank you so much, Senator Harris, and I think a big congratulations to you and um, everyone that you worked with on passing legislation last June that repealed discriminatory HIV laws uh, in Nevada that go back to the 80s and 90s, where you know fear mongering was the, the order of the day. What, just from your experience in passing like meaningful legislation like that, what are some of the lessons you learned? Well, you know, I think the most important lesson is tenacity, right? Nothing happens, um, especially this big, the very first time you try and do it. Uh, these laws were put into place with intention and laws similar to this have to be dismantled with just as much vigor uh, and intention. And so, you know, I really recognize that uh, I sit on the backs of, of plenty of people who have done study after study uh, of why these laws do not work. And it just so happened that in Nevada, we were ready uh, to, to, to bring this law over the line and get rid of what makes um, absolutely zero sense from a public health perspective um, and then and, and from a public policy perspective. So um, it's a lot of discussions. Uh, it's a lot of continuing to push forward. It's a lot of advocacy. It's a lot of uh, truth telling the truth and the facts are on our side on this issue. Um, and, and eventually you can find success in, in getting this type of thing done. Thank you so much for sharing that, Senator Harris. And of course, you know, every state and every country is going to have different circumstances, but the hearing a success story is just very important, I guess, for many advocates in this area and people uh, tuning in uh, that, you know, there is uh, organizing that we can do to combat these laws. I just want to thank our panelists for getting us cooking so far. I'm really enjoying the conversation. Um, I just wanted to, uh, before we move on to our next set of questions, I'm going to check in with AEPF's Creative Arts Administrator, Wei Tupo, to give us a brief rundown about what we've been hearing online so far, and then we'll move into a further discussion with our, with our panelists. Wei, how's it going, and how is it looking? Hey, thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, well, as usual, we have such a wonderful group in the chat and everybody is really grateful to be having this conversation on this day. Um, people are really appreciating the breakdown of all of the numbers here. So thank you to the panelists for such a wonderful and comprehensive overview. Um, a couple of comments that are really standing out. Um, there's a number of thoughts around the idea of how narratives are created and the cultural conditions that have created this reality. One person said, the fetishization of black bodies has been used to justify and perpetuate so many harms for centuries. Uh, so this idea of the culture and the narratives has been really resonant tonight. Um, there are many words of thanks to Tony for sharing her personal story. Uh, the line, I wasn't doing sex work with a master's degree because I enjoyed it, but because I was rejected for other employment was really resonant as was the question, how many trans women of color must die before we say it is a crime? Also, this notion of fear of violence and prosecution from not only transmission, but also exposure, particularly among women, seems to be another recurring theme that a lot of people are commenting on. Uh, one person said, 
Thanks for sharing with us the comparative case from South Africa, Sibu Sisiwe, where HIV exposure and transmission is not criminalized per se, but through other criminal charges. Um, and lastly, someone said, I wonder if there's a history of criminalization of health conditions on marginalized populations. This is worth researching. So, so many wonderful comments, so many great observations. Uh, thanks so much to everybody in the chat for a great conversation. And there's lots of words of thanks to the panelists for all your extraordinary work. So I'll toss it back to you, Kevin. Thanks, Zoe. And just, yeah, thank you to everyone in the chat for the very insightful comments and questions. And yeah, I'm just gonna, we're gonna get back to it so we can continue unpacking some of these issues. So Eric, I'd like to come back to you. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about how these laws developed in the 80s and 90s, and it's, it's no, uh, no secret that this was both, this is the time where, you know, H, HIV AIDS has increasingly become an issue, but this reach and the scope of the criminal justice system and the prison industrial complex was massively uh, being expanded as well. Why is it important for us to have an understanding of that specific history when we try to frame the problem of HIV criminalization? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, Kevin, that context is really important um, as we really examine where we are um, and who's impacted today around HIV criminal laws. Um, you know, if we, you know, look back uh, 1986, you know, the DEA uh, releases information about uh, the crack epidemic, um, the impending crack epidemic. Um, 1988, um, you know, the CDC releases data around the impact of, of HIV on Black women, that Black women represent 50% of the HIV cases um, at that time. Um, 1993, uh, HIV becomes the leading cause of death uh, for, for young Black men, 25 to 44. Secondly, the cause of, cause of death for uh, Black women um, in that same um, age demographic. And then you, you know, don't have the creation into, of the Minority AIDS Initiative um, until 1996. And so, you know, uh, when you have uh, a disease that disproportionately impacts Black people, uh, a criminal legal system that disproportionately impacts Black people, and you create uh, during the same time frame uh, a law uh, around that criminalizes that disease, essentially mm -hmm. making you know HIV sort of a, a, a proxy, you know, for Blackness to some degree, um, and so. You know, I think that it's really important to, you know, talk about HIV uh, criminalization um, in that way, uh, really around, you know, really building the tent um, and helping people understand that HIV criminalization is a part of our broader conversations around the criminalization um, that happens within Black communities. Um, I think oftentimes um, this issue is, is um, uh, couched or viewed as uh, an LGBTQ issue um, only, um, and it remains in that space. And so we're not able to really build that larger tent because we're not drawing those connections uh, for other communities, for uh, other movements um, around liberation um, and efforts um, around, you know, criminal justice reform. Um, that you know, folks don't necessarily see how they're able to interact in that space. And so um, I think really sort of like um, uh, looking at that history uh, and giving some context to it really helps us as we're having uh, conversations about what our reform efforts need to look like um, and who can be some of our partners in making that happen. Thanks for that perspective, Eric. And I think when we speak about how HIV is racialized, gendered, it's sexualized, I think that really impacts just the multiple in intersections and the you know the way it, uh, it, it, it is it actually embodied in the law. Um, uh, I know that you're in a you're in a state where because of partisan gerrymandering and voter suppression tactics, um, you know it's going to be increasingly hostile to to advance legal reform in Georgia, for example. What are the limits of law reform? And how do you advance positions and anti-carceral solutions in dealing with HIV, even in states like Georgia? Yeah, I mean, you know, Georgia, you know, is one of the states where there is um, 
robust coalition work happening around reforming the law. Um, and you know, folks have been working on that issue now, on the issue now, um, for, for almost a decade. And so, you know, there's been this slow sort of like chipping away at the legislature um, in terms of advancing something. Um, but you know, we are also understand the power of prosecutors um, and you know, uh, prosecutorial discretion. Um, so, are there opportunities to work with prosecutors um, to not uh, uh, bring charges under the statute. And so there's been a, a lot of work and movement around uh, working with uh, progressive prosecutors in the state this past election cycle. Uh, there are a whole host of uh, Black women who were um, elected um, who uh, are very open to having conversations about not bringing charges under the statute. Uh, these laws are based in, in fear, stigma, and uh, disinformation and miseducation. And so, you know, I think also just opportunities um, that we have to work within communities um, to reduce uh, stigma, uh, to increase education um, uh, within communities. And I think the last piece is really just around this sort of notion of, of building the tent, which is also linked to just making sure that other movements are, are really uh, aware of how um, this issue intersects uh, with with other issues as it relates to criminal uh, justice reform. Thanks so much, Eric, for just giving us some some strategies just outside of, you know, just outside of just thinking about how can you get laws passed. So thank you very much for offering that perspective to our audience today. Um, Mikhail, I'm gonna come to you. Um, you know, what else, how have some of the reform efforts you have seen um, that you have been behind. Um, how have those emerged in the in the Southern African region, especially considering that these countries have uh, countries often will have like a high stigma towards HIV, and that also interacts with uh, laws which criminalize same sex sexual conduct and sex work in the region as well. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, I think Senator Harris put it very well. I think is that you know trying to. Um, uh, trying to get these laws sorted out takes an awful lot of tenacity. Um, I've been working in this area for a very long time, and I think over the last 20 years, I've seen maybe four, five laws change throughout the, the whole the whole sort of um, Southern and East Africa. So it's a long and slow process. And I think it's important to remember that in, um, in approaching this kind of law reform, it's it's really important to work at various levels. So you need to be working not only with lawmakers, with parliamentarians, with decision makers to get them to understand why HIV criminalization is, is, is bad policy um, and doesn't work from a public health perspective, but you know, also probably more important, well, more importantly, definitely, um, is it constitutes serious human rights violations. Um, but at the same time, you need to be working from the ground up as well. And, and there's a really good example in Malawi um, of um, how women's organizations, um, and it, it's ironic because women's organizations, as I said, were the ones who were pushing for this law, you know, in the beginning. Uh, <clears throat> it was women organizations who were mobilized around um, the HIV law in Malawi that was that was being tabled. Um, and put a lot of pressure on to make sure that the criminalization provisions were removed before the bill was passed. Um, and that came completely, and you can see in the picture there, completely from <clears throat> mobilization of women, um, women living with HIV at, at a community level. In fact, they had a song, they were in parliament and they had a song that they'd written and they were singing about those, those particular section. And every time a parliamentarian tried to justify um, the inclusion of this criminalization clause, they would start singing the song in parliament about no to section, whatever it was, 352 or whatever. Um, and it worked. Um, that section was not included. Um, so it is a very, it's a long and a slow process. Um, but it's important that we do it because, it, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's really, criminal, HIV criminalization just exacerbates other, the, 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 the vulnerability to HIV and the poor health outcomes from HIV that are caused by other forms of criminalization. And it really comes down to, it comes down to inequalities. Um, 
it comes down to inequalities in terms of class, in terms of race, in terms of gender. It's not a it's not a um, coincidence that people you know people who are more vulnerable to HIV are more likely to be black in in my in my region certainly black women uh, uh, living in poverty, lack of housing, lack of access to adequate sanitation, lack of um, access to employment, um, serious gender inequalities. Um, and and criminal, HIV criminalization just really exacerbates those those inequalities, um, and it's really important to try and get these laws pushed out um, in order to take one step in the right direction of um, addressing the underlying inequalities that drive the epidemic essentially. Amazing! Thank you so much for sharing that. And just because I mean, on a personal note, I was as Malawi, my, my parents are from Malawi, so just amazing to hear the, the sort of tenacity from my Malawian counterparts in, in, and really put back against that. Just speaking on the issue of inequality, another thing I wanted to kind of to ask you as someone who's worked in the region forever, an important part is that I'm thinking about World AIDS Day, what are the, some of the inequalities in terms of uh, the pharmaceutical responses and just the ways in which the first, the, the, the you know, the, the West and the global north has to has moved uh, past and, and thinks of uh, HIV as a past pandemic and how, how do you see that inequality play out in the region? I mean I think historically there have been um, well I mean even further back historically I mean uh, colonization and racism um, in in our region have have really driven to a large extent this this epidemic um, and um, in terms, you know, historically, in terms of access to treatment, um, it was a long time, much longer than in, else in the world, before people in in southern Af southern Africa got access to affordable um, HIV treatment. Um, and the the kind of racist assumption, you know, the racist statements made at the time in terms of well, you know, you can't give these people antiretrovirals because they can't tell the time. Um, and so they won't be able to take the antiretrovirals on time. And then we're just going to end up with a resistance issue. You know, it, it's, it's, it's just absolutely mind-blowingly awful um, how that panned out. I mean, now possibly access, well, access is better um, to treatment, but, you know, there's still these inequalities in between in countries, in between the rich and the poor, black and white, urban and rural, um, you know, in terms of your ability to access health services. Um, and 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 equally, we see, you know, in terms of north-south um, inequalities. I mean, the, 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 COVID, the COVID vaccine apartheid is a real um, recent example of that. And an even more recent example of that is how South Africa has now been, South Africa and other countries, including my own country in Namibia, have been shut down in terms of travel um, because South African scientists had, you know, had the honesty to say, we've seen this new variant and it's, it's in our country. And the response is, let's just shut down Southern Africa, despite the fact that it's been identified elsewhere. Um, so that global inequality just keeps on going. And, and you know, I think that's one of the things that's so challenging about working in HIV is that in order to end the epidemic as a public health threat, um, we have to address those underlying inequalities, not only at a national level, but at the whole global level, which makes it so challenging. This is really, really, really telling because so much of the response to HIV that, that we saw, for, or we've seen for 40 years, that we're seeing with COVID now is this idea that, you know, you can manage to learn by a country, that you can keep people out, that the, a public health issue is a global issue. Um, it's, going to, it's going to exist in country to country, and one country having not solved the problem means the entire world has not solved the problem. So thank you very much for really laying out um, some of uh, just the, the global impact of this and why we should con continue to understand HIV as a global uh, a global uh, issue that the world needs to respond to. Uh, so Harris, I'm going to come to you now because I know you have to leave, but I just wanted to, to ask you, someone who has, you know, done um, uh, reform work in this area, what are some of the coalitions that we need to build 
um, uh, you know, in, in, in organizing and working uh, to advance and uh, to uh, respond to some of these laws and also advance other sort of laws which uh, uh, uplift and uh, uh, assist marginalized communities. Well, I'm going to give a little caveat. My my daughter has joined me, and she's a, a bit vocal uh, this morning, so I apologize if you can hear in the background. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, you have to have impacted persons uh, as part of this discussion at the forefront of this discussion. Uh, you may also want to have uh, some discussions with the health experts. We do have to be able to control communicable diseases, right? We can all admit that there's some safety issues uh, here as well. Um, any stakeholder that you can think of, bring to the table. Normally, uh, you're worried about too many cooks in the kitchen. I don't think that's possible when it comes to addressing an issue that is so large, that affects so many of us. Uh, we got to get as many people and as many voices in the room as possible. And only then can you come to some kind of consensus, understanding and agreement and, and get things done. Thank you, Senator Harris, and uh, we love that your daughter was able to join us as well, so no issue about that. Um, uh, as Sibu Sisiri, I wanted to come to you. Um, uh, just, uh, I know some of the work that you have done in, in sort of thinking about what the response, and uh, you're coming from a, a, a legal perspective. I know you've been looking at some of the the global initiatives around changing some of these laws, and you've looked at uh, specific guidelines which exist internationally. Can you speak to us briefly about some, the, uh, some of those guidelines and the utility of them in a local context like South Africa? So earlier this year, the UNDP introduced these prosecutorial guidelines that were aimed at assisting prosecutors to be able to um, regulate how they go about determining cases that involve HIV. And basically what these guidelines are aimed to do is to assist the prosecutors, the defense uh, attorneys, as well as judges when it comes to um, prosecuting such cases. Um, basically what the, the guidelines do is they set out a number of principles that should be applied in, in cases that involve HIV. But what they essentially do, and what which is the most critical part of the guidelines, is how they try to restrict criminalization to simply willful and intentional transmission of HIV. And they go about defining what those terms mean. Um, they also set out some of the important principles that should determine or regulate how um, cases of HIV transmission should be um, adjudicated. The most important of those is based on the principles of the law of evidence and specifically linking the two, which is linking the law and linking science. So they basically say that in order for us to be able to constitute evidence that is admissible in a court of law, we need to rely on the most recent advances in science in order for us to be able to mount cases that involve HIV. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I think it's, uh... It's good to see that there have been developments, and there's a there's an international effort to update. Uh, if we're gonna if you're gonna use criminal law, it should be updated to only the you know these rare examples where there is still space uh, for uh, for this to for this to exist. Um, but in only in cases of willful and intentional uh, transmission. And I think that what we are speaking about largely here happens, has not been those cases. So thank you very much uh, for bringing just some of the, the international developments, but of course those need to be tailored uh, uh, locally as well, uh, naturally. Um, Nathan, I wanna come back uh, to you um, because we've spoken about the initial interaction people have with the criminal justice system as people living with HIV, but it's not only just you know the, the threat of being charged or being charged with a crime. Criminalization has a very long tail in people's lives. Can you speak a little bit about um, some of the longer term effects of criminalization on people living with HIV? Sure, and I want to uh, emphasize uh, uh, a previous panelist had mentioned, you know, these HIV criminal laws are trying to achieve public health outcomes through the crim cr criminal legal system. Um, uh, and uh, we think public health uh, goals should be uh, first and foremost um, uh, led by public health organizations. And in fact, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States have said that uh, HIV criminalization runs counter to these public health goals. 
Um, what does that mean for uh, people living with HIV who come into contact with the criminal legal system? Um, so we see, for example, uh, in Missouri, black men in particular are uh, being arrested for uh, resisting arrest, spitting and biting. Uh, uh, they're brought into the police station, their HIV status is learned, and then all of a sudden now they're charged with uh, and plead guilty to uh, uh, felony HIV criminal exposure charges. Uh, and that felony conviction will last uh, their entire life. So once you're uh, 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 discharged from the criminal legal system, uh, you have a felony conviction uh, that can impact your ability to get a job, to find housing. In some states, uh, it can affect your ability to vote. Uh, in other states, we see sex offender registration I mentioned in Tennessee, uh, aggravated prostitution is now lifetime registration on the sex offender uh, registry. Uh, and that again, uh, marginalizes people who are already marginalized and stigmatized both through the criminal legal system uh, and through other social uh, channels. Um, uh, and we see that uh, a similar disparate impact when we look at these uh, um, uh, long tail effects as you describe them. So for example, in Tennessee, black women are less than 1% of the sex offender registry as a whole. And we see this in state after state, black women are less than 1%. Uh, however, they're, uh, I have the number here, I think it's something like 32% uh, of all HIV related registrations as well. So again, uh, um, uh, people who uh, are penalized normally through the criminal legal system are being doubly penalized through these HIV criminal statutes. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it just really gives us a, a, a wider lens at looking at the, at, at, the, at the problem and the problem of criminalization. You know, we spoke earlier on, uh, specifically speaking with, uh, with both Tony and Diana, um, the ways in which, uh, you know, uh, black trans women interact with, uh, the, with, with HIV criminalization laws. Um, but we, we know from our research and uh, I know from your research and from uh, our understanding of the way that gendered laws operate is that these laws have an impact not only on uh, black trans women, uh, but at black women at large. Can you explain that a little bit uh, about how uh, that operates? So uh, we see, uh, uh, especially in states that have sex work specific HIV criminal laws, that uh, black women are really vastly uh, overrepresented in the number of arrests uh, and in convictions. Um, so, for example, uh, in Florida, Black women are 8% of the state's population, but 28% uh, of uh, sex work-related arrests. We see in California, uh, Black women are 3% of the population, only 4% of the population of people living with HIV, but 22% uh, of those arrested for uh, sex work-related offenses. Um, uh, and we see the same thing with sex offender registration as well, just this, this vastly disproportionate uh, burden falling specifically on Black women. Uh, I wish I could describe uh, the uh, impact on uh, other uh, people who are female identified uh, and persons of color. Unfortunately, we can't see that very well in the data that we work with. So the Williams Institute tends to rely on uh, uh, local law and state law enforcement agency data. And what we see over and over again in the United States is that uh, uh, people are categorized as either black or not black, which means white, which tends to also under, uh, overstate the uh, proportionality on white Americans. We think that people who aren't categorized as black, who wouldn't otherwise be categorized as white, are nevertheless uh, uh, being put into that category. Uh, and so it's actually very difficult to describe the impact of these HIV criminal laws on people who aren't Black. And we think also uh, we can't do that very well on people who are white as well, because everybody else tends to get lumped into that group. That's that's really fascinating and and, and really concerning. A big part we, at the at the at the policy forum, a big one of the major campaigns, the Truth Be Told campaign, really pushing back against 
this uh, this uh, global uh, this widespread effort to to silence racial justice discourses discourses about racial equity about the systemic. Uh, effects of racism and you know the it, the basic inability to get um, disaggregated intersectional statistics uh, on race and gender uh, of, of people who interact with the criminal justice system means that our policy responses are going to be um, incapacious in, in in responding. So just really fascinating insights for someone who does uh, uh, who does research on art. So thank you for that, Nathan. Um, Diana, I wanted I wanted to come to you, um, just in your position working uh, at Gilead. What is the role um, of the pharmaceutical industry, um, which has created a lot of the uh, the treatments, which uh, have uh, alle alleviated what it means to live with HIV and to uh, prevent its transmission? What is the role of the pharmaceutical industry in providing more equitable solutions and access to treatment uh, for the management of HIV and, and its transmission, both yeah. in the United States and uh, in the global south? Thank you, Kevin. Um, yes, great question. You know, I think um, when Gilead Sciences was established back in 1987, it was a researched pharmaceutical based company um, invested in clinical research and investigations um, to treat people living with HIV. And we've made some um, tremendous scientific advancements um, for people living with HIV. So people can live longer and people can live healthier. And so we've done um, our best as far as um, provide, providing access to our treatment medications and also our prevention medicine. But not only that, um, we pride ourselves in our corporate social responsibility um, and in our core values of inclusion and diversity. Um, and we responded with um, creating many funding signature initiatives such as Compass, um, which directly um, addresses the HIV disproportional impact in the South. We just launched our racial um, equity fund, which, are, which is our multi-million dollar commitment to addressing um, race in this country and the racial inequities that um, intersectionally um, displays on HIV and people living with HIV. And then, you know, I get to um, co-manage the Transcend Community Impact Fund and, of course, lead the HIV decriminalization initiative. You know, all these initiatives, you know, are partnered with our um, community-based organizations across the U.S., and we believe that centering the voices that are most impacted by these criminalization laws should be at the table. So we were glad that almost two years ago that we met with the Health Not Prisons Collective, um, and then subsequently with the Williams Institute and the Center for Health and Law Policy to making sure that we partner with the National Alliance Partners to making sure that we address HIV decriminalization and all the social determinants that affect um, people living with HIV. And so um, we are dedicated and, commit and committed and I personally am passionate about making sure that um, we create access and we create signature initiatives that really makes an impact in our communities. Thank you for sharing that, Dan. And, and uh, it's, I think it's important to have uh, uh, people uh, like, like yourself um, who are able to advocate for the, the intersectional impacts that uh, you know disparate um, access to, to health treatment have on this issue. So thank you very much for laying that out and um, some of this, the solutions that could come from uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, Tony, I wanted to turn to you. Um, you just spoke. You spoke very eloquently and very passionately about the ways in which these laws impact uh, Black trans uh, uh, people. Um, can you explain about the specific interventions, some of the interventions that would improve the ways in which a Black man's hook manage HIV as a condition? Well, first of all, Kevin, I wanted to thank you for highlighting two success stories, mine and Diana's, um, in the trans community of color that we are uh, a success story, because most of the time in the trans community, you hear such negative uh, death, violence, homelessness, uh, our numbers are very high. So first of all, having us at the table uh, brings recognition uh, and brings leadership um, and insight to this transgender HIV uh, area. Uh, at St. James, where I was the ED for two years, St. <laughs> James is the only um, uh, sex worker clinic in America. We hired uh, sex workers and transgender folk as therapists, as managers, as directors. So what I'm asking um, today is 
for the world that's listening, if you want to help the transgender community, you got to have them at the table. They've got to be in the meetings. They've got to be at the table making decisions about how you treat them, how they can get on prep and how they can get care. You need to have people who look like them, talk to them and, and give insight. People recognize their own when they're in a dilemma and when they are feeling down and out. I remember 16 years ago, I ran across a trans woman lawyer, uh, I'm in law school now, who motivated me that if you want change, you, you have to get in the fight. Um, so I, I think hiring trans folks of color um, at the table and, and telling your state legislators as uh, California uh, State Senator Scott Weiner has got uh, SB 357 to decriminalize sex work. I think that is a first step in decriminalizing sex work and making it not taboo, making it where it's not illegal, making it where the people who need to do it without judgment uh, is how we did it at St. James. You gotta keep the judgment part out. You can't judge someone for doing what they have to do unless you're gonna pay their bills and give them a house. Uh, it's what I say. If you're gonna do that, then I'm all for your opinion and your thoughts. Once you pay them weekly and give them a home, you have the right to give them your judgment. But if not, um, you, uh, you do not. So let's get laws passed in the state that if you're carrying a condom and you're in a sex worker uh, location, that's not a crime. You can't be arrested for prostitution uh, for having a condom in your pocketbook. That means if you, if you don't have condoms, you're going to have unsafe sex, which is going to give you HIV and other diseases. So it's a double whammy um, uh, on that. So in San Francisco, they passed that law that condoms, the police can't arrest you for having condoms if, in fact, you were doing sex work. You just can't get arrested for having a condom. What if you weren't doing sex work? So laws like SB 357, decriminalizing prostitution, removing the condom stigma is the type of things that I would like to see. And let's hire some trans folks in your organizations across the world. Let's get them in your organizations and give them jobs. Uh, let's, let's put them to work and then you can hear what they're thinking firsthand on how to solve some of these issues. Thank you so much, Tony, and, and very much to the contrary to what you said. I am absolutely honored to have you at the table and uh, to, to learn from you and learn from your advocacy. So thank you very much for outlining some of the interventions that we need to, to really start being inclusive in our approach to dealing with, with HIV and HIV criminalization was more, a little bit more specifically. And I think you also just really showed us that in, when dealing with public health, uh, moralism has no place. Um, it's about the, the policies and the science. So thank you very much for that. We're nearing the end of our panel and I just wanted to give each of our panelists a brief moment in like a quick minute to just give uh, uh, one takeaway that they would hope to leave our audience today, especially, especially as we are thinking about, uh, 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 you know, 40 years since uh, HIV first uh, emerged and how we can imagine a future where it is really of the past. So Nathan, can I come, can I come to you first for your uh, call to action or your thoughts leaving the panel? Yeah, I would say people living with HIV in the United States are your brothers and sisters, they're your siblings and your neighbors, uh, they're members of your community. Uh, there is, I am sure, uh, a, a, an organization in your community right now that is doing service work with people living with HIV. Look them up, go down there, introduce yourself, talk to the people who are doing the work and the people who are being served by that work. Uh, I think the more people you know personally, the harder it is to stigmatize and marginalize a group and I think that stigmatization and marginalization are at the foundation of these criminalization laws. Thanks so much, Nathan. Eric. Yeah, I think we've said it like a few times here today, but I think it's really about making sure the folks who are most impacted are leading the charge. Um, you know, the folks who are approximate to it are the ones who absolutely have the answers. And so um, I think making sure that we are prioritizing um, communities of people who are living with HIV to lead the charge around um, helping us think about and reimagine what our solutions need to be. Thank you so much, Eric. CPC Sire. So I think my parting note is how 
we need to consider how criminalization, what, or at least its harms, really outweigh the benefits that attach to, to criminalization. If you consider how many of the harms largely relate to the public health, um, it undermines the response that we have to HIV. It undoes a lot of the testing and the treatment and the stigma that, that attaches to HIV. All of those things are negatively affected. But if you start to look at the potential benefits that come with it, you can see that they're largely individual-based type of benefits. You look at how it relates to um, retribution for the complainant or how it relates to punishment to the accused. But if we recognize that the harms outweigh the benefits, then the question that we must ask ourselves is whether criminalization of HIV is a policy imperative that is worth pursuing in these circumstances. Thank you so much for just reminding us about that. Um, Diana. Thank you. Uh, my parting thought would be that um, people living with HIV need to be treated with dignity and respect. Um, and I think, you know, you've seen today um, Tony's um, and mine story of success, um, which is far and few between in the community of trans, especially as trans women of color. And as a representative Gilead, you know, I believe that we should always center the voices of the most marginalized impacted by these laws, which is people of color, trans people and sex workers at the table and making decisions. And it really needs to be a multi faceted approach where we bring in the pharmaceutical industry, where we're bringing in the uh, nonprofit organizations, where we're bringing in the judicial system, where we're bringing in the government entities, where we're bringing in the researchers and the policy thinkers um, to the table of making sure that we address the health equities, not only in the United States, but globally. Thanks so much, Diana. Uh, Michaela. Thanks. I think, you know, my, my parting shot is, you know, just as as we can't treat our way out of an epidemic, we also can't use criminal laws to get out of an epidemic. Um, we need to address the, the the structural barriers to an effective HIV response. And primary of those barriers are laws that criminalize, laws that criminalize HIV transmission exposure and non-disclosure, laws that criminalize sex work, laws that criminalize um, <clears throat> laws that criminalize um, possession of drugs for own use. Um, so we have to address those, those structural barriers <clears throat> and, and the inequities and inequalities uh, mm -hmm. across countries that, that, uh, that drive those. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and Tony, lastly. Uh, uh, I just want to promote four core values. Uh, let's promote the full protection of sex worker human rights. Let's reject the intervention based on the notion of rescue and rehabilitation for sex work. Let's promote tr uh, transgender equality and gender equality. And then let's just respect the right of sex workers to make informed choices about their lives. So let's leave the condemnation out and let's just get to work on helping one another without the judgment and the discriminations and the predetermined uh, Christian ideals of how things should go. Uh, we, we don't know how these people are walking in their shoes. We can't judge, but I think if we were to just get in our mind that mindset of equality, of working together in the form of love, I think we could do better than in the form of judgment, discrimination, laws, um, and, and gender inequality. Thank you so much. And I think on that, uh, that very powerful directive, I'd like to, to bring the, uh, the panel to a close and this conversation to a close for today. This remarkable conversation has revealed the ways in which 40 years of intersectional failures have often led to interventions which cause more harm than good. Um, we should heed these lessons if we're ever to overcome HIV and act respond to other public health challenges facing us now and in the future. I'd like to thank especially my panelists for today, Nathan Cisneros, uh, Mick Clayton, State Senator Dallas Harris, Tony Newman, Diana Oliva, Sibusisiwe Nglela, and Eric Polk for joining us today. In addition, to, in addition to their very powerful insights, their relentless advocacy, innovative, and community-led activism should be commended today on World AIDS Day, so thank you. I'd like to thank our partners at the William Institute uh, who 
our co-sponsors and our co-hosts in putting this together, particularly Brad Sears and Nathan Cisneros for helping us host this important event. And we look forward to partnering with you again in the near future. As always, I'd like to thank uh, our awe-inspiring team at the African American Policy Forum for being such willing compatriots uh, with me in putting on this and many other shows. And I thank you today for particularly supporting me as I came out, came out from behind the scenes into the hot seat. I am forever grateful. And lastly, thank you all for joining us from around the world. To keep up these conversations with your friends, families, and within your communities, please join the fight to defeat the anti-speech efforts to stifle social justice discourse, which are spreading not only in the United States, but around the world. You can learn more about our programs through the links below, which have been dropped in the chat and on the, and on the screen right now, and look out for AAPS podcast, Intersectionality Matters, where this, we'll be posting this conversation in the coming weeks. So until next time, stay safe as we continue to aspire to build a healthier and more compassionate future for us all. Yeah, yeah.